Hi everyone, let's move on to a new topic and this might be one that you have not had much exposure to before and that is Christian or religious counseling. I want to give you a little bit of background about how I came to teach this course or this uh, topic because I didn't always, I didn't always include Christian counseling in this class. But I started noticing over the years, I've been teaching counseling for about 25 years now and over the years I've found every class has at least one or two people who are maybe interested in pastoral counseling or church counseling or Christian counseling or some kind of spiritual counseling. So on my sabbatical uh, a number of years ago, I decided to undertake a little program of study, learn a lot more about it. I am not a Christian counselor. What I tell people is that I am a Christian who does counseling, but I'm not a Christian counselor. And I'll explain this a little bit more when you see what they actually do. So a lot of, of all the spiritual pastoral kinds of counseling, we know the most information about Christian counseling. And that's going to be really what I operate from here. However, I do want you to know that some of the things that we talk about here will apply to different kinds of religious counseling. But Christian counseling is mainly the one that I've chosen here. So let's talk a little bit about what Christian counseling is started here. So this, this is interesting to me. Um, I really like this visual here. Okay, so what is Christian counseling? And I want to talk a little bit about what Christian counseling isn't. What it is, is the integration of Christian theology principles and psychological techniques. And we do this to help with the client's emotional and their spiritual growth. So that's something to think about. Um, it has arisen and become really popular because studies show that about 90% of Americans have some sort of religious belief, certainly not all Christian, but any topic pertaining to spiritual counseling has become much more popular. And depending on your leaning and your particular value system, there may be separate programs of study for each of them. Now, Despite the upcoming popularity, sometimes there are some difficult issues that we have to solve or have to deal with from a Christian counseling perspective. For example, uh, you know, Christianity talks about forgiveness and the importance of forgiveness. Well, what if someone has really hurt you? What if uh, you are um, a survivor of abuse? Do you have to forgive the person who has hurt you? Well, Christianity would say yes. Uh, some people find that a very difficult thing. Is divorce acceptable? Um, in strict conservative Christianity, it's not. So that's a question that has to be grappled with. And is reconciliation always reasonable? So reconciliation, of course, is preached by Christianity in the Bible. Um, and if you have a fractured relationship with someone uh, for a very good reason, perhaps there was some harm done to you, you know, is it really the best option to do that? So these are just some of the questions that will confront Christian counselors that they have to deal with. It actually has been around formally since the 1970s. Over here, the American Association of Christian Counselors, this is, at least for Christian counseling, the big organization in the United States, and it's huge. During the sabbatical that I was just telling you about a number of years ago, I went to their um, annual convention. It was in Nashville, Nashville, yes, at the Grand Old Opry Hotel, which is, an, as a side note, an amazing place. It's not just a hotel if you've ever been there. Uh, but there were like 20,000 people at this conference. I could not believe how big it was. And there were a lot of different sessions on different things. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those. Just a really interesting organization. So to be a Christian counselor, you requ it requires training in psychology, you know, counseling, and theology. So you can't just you know, become a psychologist and take a course or two in Christianity or theology and be a Christian counselor. Likewise, you can't get your training in theology and take a counseling course or two and become a Christian counselor. So I'm going to talk uh, just a little bit more about that. Now, Christian counseling has not always been accepted by traditional psychology. I want to be clear about that. And the reason is because traditional psychology has different values than Christianity has. We'll get into that more. But just to give you an example, Albert Ellis, who of course we have studied, has made comments about how religion, these are quotes from him, religion causes illness, religion causes a childish dependency on a faith. Those are some of his quotes. 
However, after having clients for years who talked about their religious spiritual beliefs, Ellis admitted in 1993, whoops, that the Bible is, let me go back here, that the Bible is a self-help book that likely enabled more people to make extensive personality and behavior changes than all professional therapies combined. So he became uh, a fan of that after a while. Okay, so in our discussion about um, Christian counseling, before we dive into what it what uh, types of settings that you would use it in and some research behind it. Let me talk a few things about what it's not. So there are three false assumptions about Christian counseling that are important for you to know. And we're going to abbreviate by saying CC. So the first one is Christian counseling is any counseling done by a religious person. So the thinking, so we could have a priest or a pastor, if they do any counseling with people, okay, that's Christian counseling. It's actually not. The thinking is this person is a representative of God, as a representative of God, is healing even with no religiously oriented techniques. But that is not true. So any uh, person, a religious person who does counseling, unless they are a trained counselor, that's not Christian counseling. Uh, number two false assumptions is that Christian counseling involves applying counseling techniques within a formal religious practice. So for example, again, church, pastoral counselors. So uh, if you've got, um, uh, how do I want to say it? So a similar kind of issue, if you have a religious person who is seeing, say, couples counseling, etc., and most of the people who do couples counseling on a religious basis, pastors and such, they aren't trained in counseling. That's uh, typically the case. So that's not, not, uh, not considered Christian counseling. So techniques within a religious practice, that is still not Christian counseling. And then number three, Christian counseling just involves extra techniques that we add on to secular counseling. So it's adding that religious element to a well-established counseling model. So that would be like me taking a few courses in Christian counseling, going to a workshop or a conference. Uh, I'm still not doing Christian counseling. That's not who I am. Another example would be cognitive therapy, if a counselor is doing cognitive therapy, which uses religious arguments to counter irrational beliefs. So there's a phrase in Philippians in the Bible that says, do not be anxious about anything. So if a secular counselor is using those kinds of techniques, that's still not Christian counseling. So some of the challenges that Christian counselors have, and I've alluded to uh, a couple of these here, that really for anyone who becomes trained in Christian counseling is something that may that may come upon them. One of the main ones is the fact that there are going to be blurred personal and professional boundaries. Now we've talked a lot about how ethics and our ethical guidelines calls for leaving our, person out, our um, personal values at the door, right? So any bias or values you have, you cannot put those on your clients. The problem is you have to do that in Christian counseling. That's really part of who you are. Your Christian values are interjected into the counseling by definition. So you're expected to reflect your Christian character in the office. So the problem is that truly value-free counseling is just not possible in Christian counseling. And that's something that is a challenge, especially for people who've been traditionally trained and certainly goes against traditional counseling. A second challenge is confronting dominant views of mental health. Okay, this is a big one. I want to talk about this a little bit. Um, we have to look at the, the goals of treatment and definitions of mental health to see how this applies. So for psychology, for counseling and psychology in general, mental health equals higher self-esteem, independence, and a lack of freedom from pain and guilt. So in other words, pain is really considered to be unhealthy baggage in psychology. When we have clients who come in, our goals are to increase their self-esteem and their assertiveness and independence and hopefully help them get rid of the pain and guilt they feel because that's bad. So that's psychology's view of what mental health is. Okay, Christianity has a much different view. Christianity says that pain and suffering are human beings 
uh, human conditions. They're necessary and we have to experience them, not get rid of them because they increase our dependence on God. So if you look at the Bible or if you're familiar with that, you know, people are expected when they get their human pain and suffering to turn to God to help them with that. So in secular counseling, we want to just help people get rid of that. But Christianity says, no, that pain and suffering is really important to, to increase that dependence. So another way to think about it is that in psychology, mental health, to be mentally healthy, this requires things like self-acceptance and self-reliance. Rely on yourself, uh, be independent. But Christianity points out that we are weak. As human beings, we are weak and we have to rely on God. We are broken and we are needy, so we have to rely on God. So the bottom line here really is that psychology points people to greater self-independence and determination, and Christianity points people to greater reliance on God. So it's independence versus dependence. Really, there are two different goals in mind here. Okay, so that's the second challenge. A third challenge is establishing a scientific base. So we've talked about how all the therapy techniques that we've discussed this semester are rooted in, in science. It's We do research studies and we know that they work. Well, what about for Christian counseling? It's necessary to establish itself as a legitimate form of therapy. So I'm going to talk about just a couple of the early studies on Christian counseling and what they found. One of the first ones was by um, Worthington, who who uh, is, was affiliated with Ohio State at, at one time, this was in the late 80s, he found through a study that the number of religious techniques used did not predict counseling in outcome. So if a, a counselor was uh, using prayer or scripture readings or um, some other kind of motivational thing on a religious uh, standpoint, it didn't necessarily predict a good outcome for the client. So that's number of religious techniques. What was more important, he said, were which techniques were used, and the most common that came out through this study was prayer and scripture usage, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. So these were the most common Christian techniques used by Christian counselors. Uh, a little bit more outcome research, and again, these are some early studies, Probst uh, in the early 1990s here um, found that religious cognitive therapy is most effective if it's led by a non-religious counselor. So that's really weird. That's not what you would expect. So that would be like a secular counselor interjecting religion into their cognitive therapy. So studies like that kind of threw a monkey wrench in looking at the effectiveness and the eff efficacy of um, Christian counseling. So there have been some attempts to clarify. <clears throat> Now, Wade actually did a study looking at secular counselors and their use of religious interventions and found, not surprisingly, that religious clients had a better outcome than non-religious clients when religious interven interventions were used with them. So that would make sense. Um, and how they define that, a religious person is someone who believes in a higher power and practices that regularly. Non-religious people weren't necessarily people who didn't believe but that didn't practice. Uh, with any regularity. So there needs to be a lot more research on this and there has been a, a few other recent studies which um, haven't clarified the picture too much but I'm gonna let me get into those a little bit more. Let's look at some of the specific religious interventions that can be used in Christian counseling. So we'll start off with really the most popular one and that is prayer. Um, there are a couple of ways to use prayer in sessions with clients. Um, first of all, you can use them actually, as I said, in session. So you can pray with clients in session. You can assign prayer as homework, different kinds of prayers. And you can assign, or you, excuse me, you can pray for your clients outside of session, outside of the session. So you as the counselor can pray for your clients. There really isn't any research on how the, of the effects of praying aloud in session. We don't really know that. We speculate that having clients pray outside of session provides benefits, but that's a little bit unclear. And prayer homework is really a legitimate assignment um, for many. It's a very popular technique. The research has not been great. Here is a video link that I will put down in the um, explanation or the comment section that you can take a look at. 
But the thinking is that spiritual counselors, Christian counselors, have a spiritual obligation to pray for those in their care. We just don't know what the effects overall are. And it's, of course, it's very hard to measure. It's hard to operationally define. If you read a devotional, does that count as prayer? Um, so, the, so really, operational definitions and measurement issues are one of the difficulties with investigating this. Okay, what about the use of scripture in session? Now, the first thing to know is that some studies have found that this isn't real common. And it's uncommon because counselors are kind of afraid of taking a verse out of context or maybe misapplying something. Uh, and a really good example is the verse from the Bible that encourages or says, wives, submit to your husbands. This is from Ephesians. So this has been found to be one of the most misinterpreted verses in the Bible. It does not mean, and this is biblical scholars have said this, it does not mean that wives have to do whatever their husbands want. But, I mean, I've, I've personally had clients who have said to me, who have who've refused to leave bad relationships because of this. So um, a client who is doing any kind of religious counseling needs to be prepared to deal with this verse in particular. So some counseling strategies are supported or derived from scripture. So for example, uh, I've already mentioned the verse from Philippians, do not be anxious about anything. So clients who are believers, you can draw them back to this verse and it can sometimes help them in their therapy. Okay, how about forgiveness? The use of forgiveness in counseling. This is a one of the most complex and tough issues that we come across in Christian counseling, as I mentioned at the beginning of this. So should people forgive people who have hurt them? You know, nobody has an answer to that. Um, absolutely. Nobody has an answer to that. There's no simple answer. So let's take a look at what forgiveness actually is. This is an interesting one. Um, definitions of forgiveness talk about grieving the damage, recognizing and grieving the damage that someone has done to you, and then releasing the negative emotions that are associated with the person who has hurt you. So that's technically the definition of forgiveness. It does not mean reconciliation. It's not the same thing. So you can forgive someone and still choose not to reconcile or not to be in a relationship with them. And we sometimes have this uh, with clients who have had parents who have really hurt them and they feel like they need to forgive the person, but they don't want to, and it's not good for them to be back in a relationship with them. So as Christians, the diff so that's more the secular definition of forgiveness. So as Christians, forgiveness is used to acknowledge our own tendencies toward wrongdoing and know that we are forgiven by God and then we respond in that same manner towards others. So in Christianity, forgiveness is an act of compassion coming from one person's identification, identifying with another. It's the acknowledgement that everybody does wrong, everybody sins, and you forgive another because you know your sins have been forgiven. Now here's the thing, counselors should never try and force or manipulate a client into forgiveness, ever. Uh, for one thing, if this occurs, it loses its healing power and then the client tends to have less trust for the counselor. We're supposed, you know, we need to be on the client's side. But there's a way to reconcile the two here. So in Christian counseling, forgiveness is extended uh, from one person to another out of gratitude for God's forgiveness of us. But in contemporary psychology, it's a way to make ourselves feel better. Um, it, it's a way to release emotional baggage. Um, it's a way to make ourselves feel better. So it's helpful to, to get clients to understand that you can forgive somebody, but it doesn't mean that what they did was okay. It doesn't mean that hurting you is okay. It doesn't mean that you have to get back into another relationship with them. But this is another area where clients may struggle because forgiveness in Christianity means one thing and in psychology, popular psychology, it really means another.
So this, this is a short lecture. I just wanted to cover a few things about Christian counseling. There are other issues in Christian counseling that can be important. The topic of sin, the topic of confession. Um, there's really all kinds of things. But knowing that not everybody is completely interested in this, I really just wanted to give you kind of an introduction today. So hopefully you've gotten some of the major principles uh, understood.